Okay, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize for my English. I will do my best, but it's first Friday morning, and then <laughs> I'm not used to present the museum um, in English. Then, of course, the name is difficult to say in English. Usually, we translate it like House of Elsewhere. <laughs> that is easy to, to, to express. Um, we are talking about tradition, then the idea, of course, when we are thinking to museum, we are usually thinking about art or about collections. And the collection of a museum, what we have in our collection, belong to tradition. And I would like today to introduce you some of our collection and to exp explain you how we are working on our own tradition. That is uh, uh, something that is usually not very reflect like pop culture and, and science fiction and all these kind of, of aesthetics. Uh, I will begin to just show you some images about the collection because the collection of the museum today is about like 130,000 pieces. In, in these pieces you have like books and comic books and posters and toys and games, stamps, everything like that. And the idea of the collection has to be uh, to deal with all, I mean, all the, the, the kind of objects we have uh, uh, represent or take place in another world. That's why House of Elsewhere, we are dealing with Elsewhere. Because human uh, imagination uh, try or invent a lot of different Elsewhere from the 16th century until today. That's why in our collections we have uh, for instance, the first book, that the Utopia on the, on the left, the, the book of Thomas More. And this book uh, uh, was released in 1560, uh, 1516, sorry. And it was the first book in which an author, Thomas More, decided to create a place, a perfect place, which is called Utopia. And this, in this place, everybody, I mean, all the human beings are finally happy. They don't need to work a lot, like six hours per day. Uh, they, have, uh, they don't need any more uh, uh, money or to work for money. It's like a perfect place. And the term of utopia uh, is like an um, uh, ironic name because you know that utopia has two meanings depending on how you read the, the title. It could be like Utopia, the place which is not existing, but also Utopia, the, the perfect place. And then the title has to be read like, the perfect place is the place where, uh, it's a non-place, it's a place that is not existing. And then the idea of the Utopia, the first uh, uh, step of a very huge tradition that today is called science fiction, is to create places, other places, elsewhere places, uh, uh, um, in which you can test, like a laboratory, you can test some different things. In Thomas More, for example, you have a lot of problems in England in the beginning of the 16th century, and then Thomas More decided to create this place to reflect, like in a mirror, to reflect uh, the problem of the England uh, of his time, then it's a good way to think about our problems, not just to try to think at, the, at them like in here, but just to try to imagine or to uh, invent a world. And in this world, you have new correlations, new properties that could fix or uh, show differently our own problems. The idea of utopia is easy. The poverty and the crime is related to the fact that money is divided by, uh, I mean, belong to a few people in England, what we can call today capitalists, you know? Of course, it's like anachronical, but, but uh, and of course, because most of the people has no money, they, they kind of have 
anything to do with that, they cannot, if they have a, 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 a problems, they cannot do anything with that. Then invent a world in which there is no money at all, then everybody has the same situation. Then, of course, you can uh, uh, understand that easily. If you have no money, then there is no division between humans, then there will, no, there will be no more crime or poverty. And this is the kind of, of, of imagination we have since Utopia until today in science fiction. Imagining a new world to inspect or investigate our own problems, not to propose a new way or a new society or a new world, but just to realize, to make us realize that our problem is not only uh, that, that could be seen in another other way than to use the elsewhere to think differently to our own present. And this is maybe what we have in our collections is the common point to all the books and all the uh, objects we have. They are always imagining a new world for thinking a little bit differently to our own. And then this is what we have. I show you some pictures of, of about old collections from the 16th until the 19th century. Uh, you know maybe this one, because this one is an um, engraving that you have in Swift, Gulliver's Travel, uh, and the, the, the topos of uh, an island above the ground uh, can be seen in a lot of different movies today. If you have seen The Giver, this, this dystopian young adult movie, uh, the giver, uh, the place, the world of the giver is uh, uh, close to the sky, in the clouds. And this is a very old uh, 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 images that could just tell us that we are living in here, in the, in the novel. And the real world is here, of course. And then during the novel, we are living in another world that could help us to look differently to our own world. And it's always the, the kind of... of tricks that is used in, in, in utopias. In the 19th century, uh, uh, we have two authors, very famous one, that is Jules Verne in the French-speaking world, that is not doing some science fiction. He's doing something else that is so common and so obvious for us. It is that machines, technology, change the world. For us, it's like, really obvious, but in the 19th century, it was the beginning of that. Before the 19th century, technology didn't really change anything to the world. Uh, um, you have like thoughts, like in Galileo, uh, uh, this kind of scientific knowledge, but it doesn't change the world itself. People were living like all the time, but in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, something happened, and what happened is that the material structure of the world has been changed. And that is what we can see in Jürgen's work. That's why the machines, submarines, balloons are so important for him. It's because they change something. You can go faster, you can go in other places, you can uh, uh, um, experiment the world differently. But it's not like science fiction precisely. It's more about the fact that in our world, technology is like a character is something that we have to live with, and that is changing ourselves, our uh, relationship to the world, to the time, to the space. Yeah, I, I show you some pictures. And in the museum, in the Maison d'ailleurs, we are trying to tell the story of that, uh, try to uh, imagine or try to, to understand that we are living or we are deeply engaged in uh, popular culture. Everybody in this, uh, today, for example, know Spider-Man. That is quite interesting because Spider-Man, that was born in 1962, is dedicated to, to teenagers in the US market. There is no purpose to know this character uh, today. But of course, because of the 80s, pop culture began to investigate everything, to invest everything like cinema, books, but also advertising, sometimes also politic uh, uh, um, images, then, then this, I, this culture, this pop culture thing, 
is very important to, 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 for us because it's part of our own imagination. And what we are trying to do in the museum is to tell the story of our own imagination through the pop culture objects. It's like this hidden history of the 20th century that is, by the way, or paradox, uh, it's, like a, it's kind of a paradox. It's a hidden history, but we perfectly know and live in here because it's everywhere. Uh, in the French-speaking world, for example, for instance, uh, uh, superheroes were released at the end of the 70s uh, uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the libraries. Then we thought that superheroes began to be published in the 70s. But, but in fact, uh, uh, Superman is 1938, and, uh, and then the, the, the superheroes began in the 30s. I will talk to that later. Um, then all this kind of book that nobody never read, by the way, uh, um, are interesting because our own imagination of the future of technology is usually inspired by that. That's why, for example, today we are all thinking that in the future there will be flying cars. But you know that flying cars is a very old fantasy. It's, it came from the 50s. We also realize real flying cars but it's not very easy to do because the problem is not that technology is not enough, it's that we have to change all the roads because our road cannot absorb a lot of flying cars. That's why we didn't really develop flying cars. It's not because we don't have the technology, it's because the infrastructure of the society doesn't really allow it. Then, uh, um, yeah, we like these old books, and I saw in the in the library uh, uh, in the beginning of the uh, at the entrance of the of the place that you have some of those kind of books uh, of science I and mean, bad science fiction. Um, then Utopia uh, from 16th century until 19th century was a way to tell the story of an elsewhere in which we can see our own problems. It's like a mirror. In the 19th century, uh, we uh, transformed something. The perfection of utopia begin to, began to be uh, like the progress of contemporary or modern society. We are, have all this imagination that in the future things will be better than in the past. That is quite difficult to prove, by the way, because why the future has to be better, it could be worse. Uh, um, and the idea that utopia can be in the world, not in the books, but in the world, is a very important imagination of the 19th century. Uh, and it is a reaction to this imagination that give, gave birth to science fiction. Science fiction was, in the beginning, a way to say, I don't think that technology and sciences will create a better world in the future. Because these sciences and those technologies change our own human being, our own human condition, and transform us in something else. And they transform us in, for example, a machine that is called robots, or in a pure spirit that is called uh, artificial intelligence. Then science fiction use a very important and I think very interesting uh, uh, um, um, part of our own imagination is what we call metaphor. The fact that when you see a robot in a movie, it is not the image of the technology, but it is an image of a human being when this human being is considered by himself first like a machine. When I'm doing all the, day, the, the old day the same things, without reflecting to that, am I so different from a robot? Of course not. And that's what we have in science fiction. It's like utopias, but in our, in our world. Uh, yes, machines will help us to uh, uh, um, don't have to do a lot of very tough things in, in, in work. But at, this, at the same time, they transformed it, us a little bit in robots. And this is exactly what science fiction is usually doing. Um, science fiction began in those magazines. Maybe you know that it's what we call Pulp Magazine. And if you see, if you saw the movie Pulp Fiction from Tarantino, Pulp Fiction is an homage <laughs> to those kind of magazines that are 
very cheap. Uh, uh, with this cover, uh, with a lot of colors. That's why in the in the movie all the colors are so strong. It's because the covers of the pulp magazine are strong. But inside these books, uh, these kind of books, you have only novels. That's why you see on the first number, uh, the first issue of Amazing Stories on the left, that you have in the book stories from Wells, the British author, Jules Verne, and Edgar Allan Poe. It's like something that were issued every month, and you can be continue the story. You like the story of Wells, then you have the, all the stories diffracted in several issues. Then you will buy every month, of course, your magazine to follow the story you like or to discover other kind of stories. And all the American order of science fiction began their career in these kind of uh, uh, magazines. Usually nobody has never seen a pulp magazine. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you already see a pulp magazine. Uh, the only thing maybe you know is like Reader Digest. Reader Digest is like an avatar of these kind of things because in the beginning the ma pulp magazine were big and because of some cost they reduced the size and they call it Digest. Then the pulp magazine, the big one, the Digest is the small one and the Reader's Digest is like a new way of conceiving that. But the form, the format is the same, several stories that you can follow the, uh, during the next issues. But this kind of covers has a very important things of our imagination because our imagination of the future is linked to that. Of course, we are, we are there, we are in the 20s, 26, uh, uh, on, the left, uh, on the left 29, on the right. And uh, those kind of, of images, you see the the island up, uh, up uh, above the sky, like we saw in, in Swift, uh, Gulliver's Travel, um, were part of our imagination. And sometimes it's very interesting because when we, you, you're speaking with someone about his idea, his idea about the future, uh, mostly, maybe 90% of what you think about the future is like coming from some images or some scenarios from science fiction. And this is why the pop culture just is part of our, our life. It's not because only we are going to see some Marvel movies. It's because our way to conceive the future or technology or the future of the technology is already modified by our own scenarios or about scenarios that came from science fiction. And that is maybe what we are trying to do in the museum, just to you know, say, okay, maybe more a lot of people today are afraid about artificial intelligence because we believe that maybe one day, because they will become more and more clever or intelligent, then we believe that one day they will replace ourselves. But this scenario is a very old one. The first book that, were, uh, that, was, uh, um, uh, that was written about the robots is in the 20s, is the drama. And in this drama, you have humanity that conceive a lot of robots. And those robots were human beings like you and me without any souls. They don't have souls. But it's just like body and, and flesh and blood. It was not machines. But a human without any soul is a machine. Metaf it's a metaphor of a machine, of course. And those robots began to be spread all around the world to help human beings, of course. And one day, a, a young uh, a woman decided to give them soul. They, 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 she seduced an engineer. That is quite easy, usually. Um, <laughs> and they, 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 they ask, she asked him to put some soul, to add a soul to the robots. And of course, as soon as the robot have a soul, as soon as, soon as a human being be, be, become conscious of itself, they didn't accept to be like a machine for the others. Then they enter in rebellion, and then they decided to kill all the human being. This is the first scenario. It's not a very good one, by the way. But the first scenario about the robots that you can find also in Metropolis, the movie of Fritz Lang. Until today, the way we are conceiving AI today is really the same way that we were conceiving robots in the 20s. The difference is that we think that it's really possible for the AI to replace ourselves. In the robot, it was a drama, it was a fiction. And then a, a good way to understand our own imagination is to tell the story of this pop culture that is very 
everywhere today. Okay, I, say, I, see, uh, I show you some pulp magazine for the French speaking. Captain Future is the inspiration of what we call Captain Flamme. Captain Flamme. This is the, the, the pulp heroes that were in, uh, uh, um, uh, adapting in, in Captain Flamme. That is a cartoon of the uh, end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. In France, uh, in, Fra in, in France, science fiction uh, began to be published in the 50s, in the 51, by the way, with two very important collections, that is, uh, um, the, uh, with uh, the publisher stock on the right, but another one that you have in the, in the library there, that is Fleuve Noir. This is the collections that, spread, that were spread on the market, the French market, in the 50s. But the problem with science fiction is that because it's maybe an American aesthetic or tradition, and maybe because in the 60s, 50s, 60s, uh, French literature were really in some very particular movements, like very formal, like the writing is speaking about the writing, uh, we didn't really study or we didn't really pay attention to science fiction that, were, that was like, okay, science fiction is for young teenagers, usually male, interesting by science. And that's why during maybe 20 or 30 years, nobody really take care about science fiction in the academic level. Then all these kind of books, that is, by the way, a good one on the left, a bad one on the right, uh, um, were reading by a lot of people, but, but mm, like very, like a ghetto, like fan people that were reading and reading science fiction. And the museum has been founded by one of these guys, because the Maison d'Ailleurs has been founded in 1976, because the first collector, uh, they were a collector, and this collector has 40,000 pieces, and he didn't have any place at home. Then he decided to find a way to give his collection to a city, and he was dealing with Paris and Yverdon, that is science fiction by itself. Um, <laughs> And Paris, Paris, because of what I just said about the statue of science fiction in the 70s, were not interested by that, of course. But Yverdon has, at this time, only one museum, and they accept to take the collection to create the museum, because they, were, they, they, they just said, like, OK, we have only one museum, now we will have two museums. It's better to have only, <laughs> than to have only one. And that's why the museum has been founded in Yverdon-les-Bains. Uh, in 90, the, the 1st of May, 1976, to just welcome the collection of Pierre Versant, that is the first director of the museum. And since 42 years now, we are collecting and collecting and collecting and doing exhibition about our collection of our, our contemporary art to just continue this mission to inspect or investigate our own imagination of the future sometimes, or about very important social phenomenon that is related to science fiction, or to pop culture. Yeah, we have these kind of interesting things. Um, what is interesting also with science fiction is that uh, you have a lot of science fiction, even though we, you don't know that it's science fiction. You have this very important and very famous magazine that is Metal Hurlant. Uh, it's a, the new comic, French comic books in the 70s, and most of the people that were publishing in Metal Hurlant like Möbius, Bilal, and these kind of people are doing some science fiction in a kind of underground magazine that is not read by everybody, but only by people that are interested by science fiction. In Japan, of course, uh, certainly due to the fact that Japan has been occupied by the U.S. Air Forces, uh, the, the U.S. Forces between 46 and 52, uh, and then a lot of pulp magazine has been spread to Japan during these years. Uh, uh, science fiction is really important for in, in Japan, but of course we are, have a specific science fiction that can, cannot be read like in US or in Europe. Uh, um, that's why Akira, maybe you know the, the books, or the comic books Akira or the movie, is not a way to, to think about the future, but it's a metaphor about how Japanese new generation of the 80s, young people like this guy, uh, has been transformed by technology that is the 
main purpose, political purpose of Japan to develop technologies and to be one of the first uh, uh, power in the world on this topic. Uh, and they decided to enter in a rebellion against that and they decided to say we are we stop with this authority, stop with all this question about the, the war and the atomic bombs. We have to find and to create something new. And they are using science fiction to create this new world that is an image, a metaphor, about what the youth, youth in, uh, in uh, Japan were living in the, in the 80s. Of course, we have like a collection of comic book, US comic book, um, uh, especially the first number of Fantastic Four. Um, the, 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 the comic book are important because they are the same kind of magazine than the, the, the pulp magazine. By the way, uh, uh, Stan Lee just died some days ago and the founder of Marvel uh, um, uh, were, was the, the, the chief uh, editor of a pulp magazine before. Because the, the, the pulp magazine and comic book are the same publishers, the same illustrators, the same uh, uh, scenarists, etc. It's like two way of doing some business. You like to read, take the pulp magazine. You like comic books, you take the comic books. Uh, but, but the money go to the same syndicates and the same editors and publishers. Okay, uh, we also have a, a pasta collection from movies. Uh, but now I would like to speak a little bit more about the, the exhibition because the museum has all this collection uh, uh, and we are working sometimes ourselves but also with researchers or curators or people like that. Uh, um, but the, the, what we saw usually about the museum is the exhibitions. And, and I, I took the, the museum direction like almost 10 years ago and the idea was to say, with all these collections, with all these like treasures, because the treasure of a museum is its collections, uh, we, we will like to, to, to understand a little bit more what we are living today. And we are using the collection, we are using the sources to think differently about our time. That's why in the beginning I said that the museum is the museum of, of our time. We are diving in the tradition, in the pop culture tradition, to investigate differently our present. Then that's why, um, uh, okay, I, it's just because of the title. For example, Superman, Batman and Comics was an exhibition about, of course, comic book, but especially the fact that today we all have in our own life to be superheroes. I will say something later. We also do an, an exhibition with Alpha Brick that was uh, a way to investigate the, what we call the franchise. The fact that today when you have a movie, at the same time you have toys and games and video games and that we are building world not with only novels or things like that, but also with the economic process, process. And of course, today we know that perfectly well because we have TV series. And TV series is exactly the kind of creating a world in multiplying the number of issues. That is not very obvious, by the way. For example, I prefer to read a book. And I'm a little bit, I don't like to read like 15 books of the same saga. It's like too, too many for me. I don't have time for that unfortunately. We, uh, we don't see very well on this, but we also have done an exhibition of, about robot. Uh, the, the name was Portrait Robot. Like, you know. uh, and the exhibition on robots was, also, was to investigate this idea that robot is our own portrait. It's not machines, but it's when we are deciding to just put our soul away. Okay, we have done some exhibition about digital art. Or last year, we have an exhibition about Star Wars that is not Star Wars, by the way, but it was a, uh, an exhibition about myth today. The fact that we decided to kill our own myth before, but today the new myth came and passed through our, anima our, our imagination by fiction. This is some, uh, I will just go to the first exhibition. This is some uh, images of the museum. Um, Okay, then for the comic book, 
uh, we, 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 we worked with the history of comic book, but we also worked with five artists uh, that uh, were using comic book um, to say something else. And maybe I think it's maybe the, 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 the main purpose of the museum to, to see how Spider-Man is saying something about us, not about the comic book, but about us first. That's why I like the, the work of Mathias Smith, that is a French Swiss artist, that you see that Spider-Man is always encaged, imprisoned in, the, in his own uh, uh, frame. He doesn't be able to go away or to live in real New York City. He's always in the, in the frame of the, of the comic books. And he's also explaining something about us, maybe about more about teenagers, because Spider-Man has been drawn for, for teenagers, is that we are sometimes imprisoned in ourselves. It's impossible to find a way to go out and we are always you know putting our web everywhere but it's impossible we are staying remaining in our own case uh, old blocks uh, we also worked with uh, italian uh, uh, sculptors uh, uh, which is called adrian tranquilli and he was he was using superheroes aesthetics to to attack or criticize the end of the virility. You know that because, of course, superheroes express what we can call virility. They are like big, powerful, uh, full of muscles. Uh, uh, and it's, of course, like this kind of American power of we, we will like decide to rule the world and all these superheroes are strong and save everybody uh, from uh, uh, the, 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 the aliens or other kind of problems and tranquilly decided to use those shapes to say that today those shapes are dying that this kind of virility perfect virility that is that came from the 30s is beginning to die that's why superman is crucified in the wall or spider-man just say seems to say help and not to send his web but just to say help just take me out of the wall uh, that's why also Batman, it's not really, we cannot really see it on the, on the, on the picture. Uh, his logo, the, the bat on the, on the chest, is uh, uh, um, disappearing, like everything is falling down. Uh, it, it was interesting because it, it was a good way to say, we are always thinking about ourselves of being a super. You have today to be a super hus husband or wife, a super friend a super parent, uh, dad or mother. You also have to be in full health, don't smoke, do sport, uh, be uh, then everything, like you have to be all that. It is impossible, by the way. And as soon as you are trying to say, I would like to fit with this perfect model, the only thing that could uh, uh, arrive on you is deception. It's impossible. It's like a neurotic system. I'd like to reach that, but it's impossible. Then I continue all the time. It is always impossible, always impossible. Then superheroes are also a good image of this neurotic system that asks us to be perfect. And we are running to find that. You have to go in a fitness center, you will see that. Um, then we were using this tradition to explore the fact that why don't we accept to be fragile, and to be in, in, in the incapacity of being super. And it was a very interesting exhibition. I don't think that most of the people understand this, uh, what, what I would like to do with the exhibition, but I like that. <laughs> we also worked with uh, uh, what we call like uh, Alpha Brick was a way of how we can build fictional universes. That, as I told you before, it was a, an exhibition to investigate this, the concept of franchise, the fact that a, a brand is declining itself in so many products that, 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 that they were surrounding you all the time that it's impossible to just uh, uh, say no to that. It's like, like an invasion of products. And, and the industry or the popular culture industry today doesn't really accept to develop a movie or a video game if it's not possible to decline it in several other products. And the exhibition was doing that uh, with two uni uh, three universes, the universe of Star Wars with a, a, a French illustrator that, that were doing his own Star Wars universe. It's not the official one, it's just like trying to, to do something. 
But we also work with John Howe, the, the, the Canadian but now Swiss artist that worked with Peter Jackson on uh, uh, Lord of the Rings because Peter Jackson didn't have any universe when he has to adapt Lord of the Rings in the movie. What, is, what, the, 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 what this universe looks like, it's impossible to say because in Tolkien the description is not very obvious. Then he asked John Howe to put his painting and say, okay, I see the paintings, now I will shape the universe. It's, it's, it was very interesting, that's why in John Howe sometimes you can see, oh, I see that in the movie. Hey, it's normal because the movie adapts this painting on the screen. And what is very interesting in John Howe is most of his painting takes some Swiss landscapes. Um, because he's living in Neuchâtel, then he was always you know, wandering in the forest. Uh, uh, and then sometimes he just draw something that he saw during his uh, 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 ballad. And he was, he was telling me, like, it's funny because millions of people saw the lack of Neuchâtel the, uh, because of the movie, because the, 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 the image Peter Jackson took for uh, uh, the, the movie is the image of the lake of Neuchâtel. And it was like so funny to say, okay, most of the people see that or, or some other forest in the, in the, um, around. But uh, of course, nobody knows that. They said there is full of Switzerland in this movie, but nobody knows except he. <laughs> That's why also we, we, we do like a mise en abîme, then we have the museum. And inside the museum, you have a small museum uh, in which we, we ask people to do some Lego, uh, um, what we call diorama, like le Lego landscape. It was not about Lego, it was about the fact that with little bricks, we can build a universe. And now you go upstairs and say, with little bricks, books, novels, comic book, movies, series, you can build a new universe. And we are living in this universe. For the robot, um, uh, we were uh, showing some robots um, that were always asking you some questions or provoking emotions. For example, we used the now robots, but he was always lying to you. He was asking you some questions, but he, when he has to answer, he lied to you. And it was impossible to understand that because in our own imagination, a robot cannot really lie to people. It's not programmed for that. Human body, a human uh, uh, being can lie, but not Robert. <laughs> then we were also, this is one, one of the masterpieces of the exhibition. People has to go there, they can sit down on the, on the table, and you have a robot that were drawing the portrait of the visitors that we were putting on the wall. And, and the, the, the specificity of this portrait that they has been drawn like in the, the same style of the artist himself. Then you were sitting on the chair, you know, that it was a robot because you have a like, camera in front of you that you just... And people just say like, stay for 20 or 30 minutes in thinking that they don't have to move. But of course, it's a robot Then they just took a picture and then they draw the pictures. <laughs> um, and it was also a, say, a way to say, we are projecting in the robot what we are. That's why when we are afraid about the fact that the robot one day could destroy humanity, we just have to, rea uh, to, 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 to know or to, to, rea uh, to think that usually human beings destroy humanity. We don't need robots for that. We are very good by ourselves. Uh, uh, but it's easier to project on the robots because it's a good way to stop thinking about ourselves, don't reflect about ourselves, our, uh, about our meanings, actions, etc. Uh, yeah, we have done a, a concert with robots. It's a Berlin artist, very interesting one. We also worked with the fact that we are more and more living uh, in digital world. That's why uh, we have done an exhibition with French artists that were creating like a ballad, like in a forest of digital data. Then people were in the exhibition and they can interact with everything I have a picture, for example, you have a square in here, you have like a cube, and when you are in the cube, in putting your, your hands close to the walls, it was moving with you. And it was interesting because uh, people were just like dancing in the, in the exhibition. And, and, and sometimes you say, okay, what, what have you done? What is the experiment you have? 
do you just realize that all these things are only information projecting the world and it's, you were wandering in a very abstract space and people just like the idea that they are creating the meaning by themselves because there is no meaning you have like you see it's impossible to have a meaning with that but in dancing and in moving in the space you are creating your own dance and your own meaning and then sometimes we saw we have seen like two old people just dancing very uh, um, uh, and saying very shy to, to, to be sure that nobody is looking at them. And they were dancing together in these very strange scapes. And they were, uh, uh, of course, improving emotion that is uh, related not to the digital world, but the interaction with the digital world. Yeah, we have a, a bridge that is linking two parts of the museum that is not very, you know, so like, like a s curve. And it was difficult to walk with the, we, we project like anamorphosis, then when you are walking on the, on the bridge, it was moving with you, then it was like strange. Just go uh, a little bit further. Um, and for uh, uh, Je suis ton père, I am your father, of course, we took the phrase of, this, of, of Star Wars, but why? Uh, it's not because of Disney, because of course I cannot call an exhibition Star Wars, I have to pay some rights to Disney. Because what I liked, and when you say to someone now, je suis ton père, or I am your father, it's very weird to know that most of the people begin to be first to say, oh, Star Wars, that is strange by the way, I am your father is not like, doesn't belong to Star Wars, it's like, I said that to my son, I am your father, by the way. <laughs> But, but it's not a, a link to, to, to Star Wars. But then the idea was to say, I am your father is a very common phrase. But now, today, this phrase reminds us Star Wars. Then, then this is the process or the hard process of the myth. In the myth, you have the idea that the myth can spread in our imagination and own language. And we don't really realize that this is a myth and the exhibition was to uh, investigate about the myth with artists um, that were using like the language of Star Wars transforming it to say something else and it was very interesting because most of the people believe that it was an exhibition of Star Wars because you have only Star Wars in the exhibition but it was not the case it was about the fact that with this language that Star Wars is a language and with the, this language, you can do Star Wars-like, like doing exactly like in Lucasfilm today, Disney, but you can also appropriate yourself the language and say something else, because the language is full of meaning and full of symbolism. And that was the idea of, of, of the exhibition. Uh, if I have to show you something. Um, yeah, we have these big pictures, the big photographies. Uh, uh, with the, the French artist Cédric Delso, and these photographies always uh, are a, combi a combination between two things, uh, the um, real world and the language, the Star Wars language implied in the, in the photography. Then usually people saw Star, uh, Darth Vader in here, for example, and they saw the, the walker, but they don't really realize that behind the, the picture, uh, you have a new, the new airport of Abu Dhabi that is today, then they don't really know how to understand the pictures. And if you put the Abu Dhabi airport and the walkers and, 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 and Darth Vader, you have three or two different languages, the language of the real world and the language of Star Wars. And how is it possible to combine them and to, for, for understanding the, 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 the work? And uh, it was really interesting because people recognize but doesn't really know how to make sense to the photography. Of course, it's a good metaphor of imperialism because the walkers are the big power, the, the weapon of the empire and the Abu Dhabi airport is, uh, of course, signification of the empire. Uh, um, and because of Darth Vader that is from the back, you, you are this, the, the visitors were in the same position that Vader, they are looking at the pictures the same way that Vader was looking to the walkers then you know that Vader is the chief of the empire, but you, are, you have the same position 
then you are the chief of the empire. It's a way to say uh, we are all the chiefs of the capitalism today because we are all deciding to exploit and to you know, transform the world to take all the resources. It's not the others, it's not big companies, it's ourselves. And then people were <coughs> interested in the image, like integrated in the image uh, for thinking about ourselves. Um, then at the end, I think I, I, I'm at the end. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the idea of the mu museum, I think that's, it, it's a little bit more clear, is to say, we have all the collections, the pop cult culture collection of the 20th century. Um, and usually this kind of collection has to be thrown away because nobody kept the first number of amazing stories before. You bought, bought it like 10 cents, you read it, and then you threw it away. But some people decided to kept all these collections. Uh, um, during the 20th century and re received all these collections today. Then we have like the big, bigger collection about not only science fiction but pop culture collection in the world. And all these objects are like sources. They are not first objects or magazine or novels or comic book or posters. They are sources because with these sources, with this uh, information, we can begin to tell a story, like to put things together, to tell a story uh, about this pop culture, but also about what we are today and what we can understand today about our own actions, uh, thinking, and sometimes also, also practice because now today, we, I mean, two weeks ago, we opened an exhibition. The name is L'Expo dont vous êtes le héros. Uh, it's like the exhibition uh, uh, in which you are the hero. I mean, you are the hero of the exhibition. Um, it's about game, not video games, it's about games. And we, we, do, we have done an exhibition about the fact that the game industry today increased like since 10, 15 years. Then more and more people are playing. They are playing to video games, board games, role playing games, etc. And then the, the idea is why? Because this is a very difficult question. Why are we more playing today than 20 or 30 or 50 years ago? And usually the answer is because of the market that is very easy. Usually when you don't know how to say or how to answer, you say it's because of the market. Um, but it's not because of that, because humanity play from more, I mean, the, the, the chess game has like 5,000 years uh, uh, has been, yeah, I think we, we are playing to this game from, I don't remember, it's four or 5,000 years, like, okay, long time ago. And then we are always trying to, to answer that, why there is so many superheroes in the cinema because of the market why uh, star wars is so important since 40 years because of the market uh, why uh, there is a lot of robots all around us because of the market and i think that the answer is not this one and i think that the mission of the museum is trying to find other way to answer the the, the this question in using the collection in using our own sources that can let us more and more understand why we are playing, for example, today in the exhibition. Then thank you for your attention. I would like to say about education, but I think it's not very interesting that we are doing a lot of workshop for children, teenagers, adults. Um, but maybe if you have some questions, I can uh, answer it. Thank you. Thank you.